Hello, welcome back to the second episode of chapter 4. Today we will discuss automatic vectorization feature of the compilers, where it can be used and how to diagnose it. But this discussion will cover only basic principles of automatic vectorization. Later in the course, in the next chapter actually, we will cover code optimization for vectorization. In order to achieve vectorization and portability with less effort, we can rely on automatic vectorization in the compiler. As the name suggests, automatic vectorization may occur without any action on the programmer's part. In simple applications, this is indeed correct. However, we will learn in this course how to assist the compiler in implementing optimal code paths. The code listing in C that you see contains the code for adding B to A, which we have already seen in multiple implementations. This time we will compile this code with the Intel C++ compiler. When we compile, we will use two compiler arguments, dash q opt dash report, which tells the compiler to produce optimization report, and dash q opt dash report dash phase column back, which limits the report to only automatic vectorization feature. Those arguments tell the compiler to generate a vectorization report and put this report in a file. The file name is by default the same as the source file name, and the extension is .optrpt. In the optimization report, we can look up the block corresponding to code line 14. As we can see from the compilation report, the compiler vectorized this code. We can now run this application, it produces correct result. However, we know that behind the scenes the calculation was vectorized, meaning that VPU, vector processing unit, is used instead of scalar ALU, arithmetic logic unit. If we want to port our example application to the mic architecture, all we need to do is to recompile the code with the argument dash MMIC. In this case, the optimization report also tells us that the loop was automatically vectorized, and we can run the code on an Intel Xeon FICO processor to see that the result is correct. Optimization report is the most direct way to tell if your application is using vector instructions. Automatic vectorization is enabled at the default optimization level dash capital O2. Automatic vectorization by Intel compilers is typically very flexible and the compiler is able to vectorize loops with more complex expressions than what we saw. However, there are limitations on what the compiler can do for vectorization and it is important to design loops in such a way that those limitations do not prevent automatic vectorization. Specifically, only four loops can be vectorized and the number of iterations in four loops must be known at runtime and for more aggressive optimizations even at the compilation time. For example, if your loop has a more complex termination condition than the typical i less than n, the loop may not be vectorized. Additionally, memory access in the loop must be regular, ideally contiguous, but non union stride loops may also be vectorized. What cannot be vectorized is the loops with indirect memory accesses, loops with vector dependence, while loops, loops with complex branches. Typically, the compiler tries to vectorize the innermost loop, however, there are ways to override this behavior, for instance, by using SIMD pragma. But we will talk about this and other pragmas, compiler clues, later during this video course. A good way to think about automatic vectorization is that if you cannot think of a way that a loop can be expressed with the vector instructions, the compiler likely cannot either. In case where automatic vectorization fails, redesigning the code, algorithm and data structures may lead to better performance results. So, to summarize, we saw how loops in high-level languages with data parallelism can be automatically vectorized by the compiler. Besides loops, programmers have one more way to express opportunities for automatic vectorization to the Intel C, C++ or Fortran compilers. I'm talking about array notation. Array notation is a C and C++ language extension in the Intel compilers. It allows to apply an operator or a function to entire array or slices of arrays. The compiler will vectorize expressions with array notation wherever it is possible. Here are some examples of array notation. In this expression, we add 16 elements of array B to 16 elements of array A. In the array notation, first number indicates the beginning of the slice, 
Second number corresponds to the length or number of array elements we want to use, and later we will show that the third number can be used to specify this trait. As you can see, here we express a slice of array A as 0, 16, which means 16 elements starting from index 0. For array B, 32, 16 means 16 elements starting from index 32. We can also specify non unit strides. For example, here we add elements of B with a stride of 4 to elements of A with a stride of 2. Our experience shows that array annotation is particularly useful for vectorizing loops with strided memory access, because the compiler is able to better detect vectorization patterns with the array annotation than with loops. Finally, the third example illustrates how to apply operations to entire array on stack with implicit notation. Colon means all elements in the array. Array notation for multidimensional arrays is also supported. In Fortran, array notation is supported by modern Fortran standards and by the Intel Fortran compiler. Remember that the syntax of array notation is slightly different in Fortran. Array notation in C and C++ is enabled by default in the Intel compilers and does not require additional compiler arguments. However, if you are writing code that you would like to make portable across different compilers, you may want to protect expressions with the array annotation using the preprocessor macro underscore underscore intel underscore compiler, as shown in this listing. That is all for now about automatic vectorization and array annotation. In the next episode, we will consider cases when compiler refuses to vectorize the user's code due to assumed vector dependence. We'll demonstrate how to overcome those obstacles if you don't have true vector dependency in code. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope to see you in the next episode.